Greetings, everybody. Welcome. Muy buenos días. Muy bienvenidos. Que sean muy bienvenidos aquí. Yo soy Ryan Michael Atencio del parte de CARB, the California Resources Board, and you are in the breakout room for Imperial. And we're going to be talking to my good friend and counterpart, Luis Olmedo. Uh, on this subject of pollution and prejudice um, in his community, moving from redlining to revitalization. Before we get started, a couple of things. Um, please use the chat um, when, only when instructed uh, by the presenters. There's a lot of attendees, and so we want to keep that enabled. If anything pops up that is appropriate or offensive, obviously you are subject to removal. We have the third part of our team who's helping us, Mackenzie. She'll be in the background. Mackenzie and I, uh, is my co-facilitator, but I'll be facilitating the discussion. Um, also, when we get to the Q&A portion of the presentation, uh, don't forget to use the hand raise icon uh, additionally, you should know that there's going to be closed captioning on the screen because this is being uh, recorded. So uh, with that out of the way, um, I wanted to get into um, our main topic, uh, which is um, Luis Olmedo and the stories that we have to tell together to you today. Uh, Luis is the executive director of the Comité Civico del Valle. They're an organization uh, located in um, Imperial. They work on environmental health issues in the farm worker communities of Imperial and Coachella. Um, actually, for over 20 years, I think Luis has advised local, regional, and state programs on environmental health issues uh, affecting rural communities in California. And he's also been involved in, in litigation at the local level to enforce government regulators to more effectively protect residents um, from air pollution but other environmental harms and we'll get into that shortly but before we get to uh, Luis uh, in real life and I'll stop sharing because we have him here virtually IRL but um, we wanted to pull up a poll so I don't know, McKenzie, because I wanted to get a sense and I wanted Luis to get a sense of where everybody is, is at um, in terms of the setting, geographic setting. So Mackenzie, can you pull up the first polling question, please? You bet, just launched. So if I can ask our audience members to kind of go through a couple of these questions, because you know, Luis and I wanted to get a sense of the room and, and see who we're talking to here. So we'll give you guys a couple of seconds and we appreciate it. Okay, we'll go about 10 more seconds. We're getting some good uh, responses here. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, end the poll now. And I'll share the results with you all, um, if you're able to see. And I'm, I'm not sure if you're able to see that. I, Mackenzie, should I share the screen or? I believe it should be showing people the results. Okay. So do you know where Imperial County is? Uh, about 80% of you do. Um, have you ever been there? Only about half of our room has been to Imperial County, southeast corner of the state of California, right at the intersection of Arizona, and uh, the state of Baja California and um, uh, east of San Diego. 
Um, have you ever been on a toxic tour about only about 15% of you have, and would you like to go? Um, and uh, yes, uh, overwhelming majority, about 80% would like to, to, to go on one. So that's great. That's great to know. We can dig into that. Um, before we do, um, I wanted to give some space to talk to our, our guest, uh, Luis Olmedo. I, I introduced him um, at the top of the, of, of, of the workshop, but Luis, I wanted to um, give you a, a couple of uh, a minutes here to introduce a little bit about your organization, and then we can kind of get into a discussion uh, and, and, set, and share some of the good work that, that you've done over the years and that I've been able to, to work with you on. Um, so let me ask you, Luis, um, can you tell us a little bit about you and Comité? Yeah, absolutely. Th thank you, Ryan. Um, I appreciate the uh, poll and getting the understanding of, of the audience. Uh, thank all of you who've joined us uh, today. I know there's a lot of great uh, workshops uh, at the same time, I believe, right, simultaneous. So the fact that all of you were interested in this, I, I truly appreciate it. Um, uh, we're actually really proud of our history. Um, uh, the organization was founded back in 1987, and it was founded by local farm workers who had had you know some involvement around the farm worker movement, and like you know many movements, a lot of opportunities for leadership development. Uh, so you know, their sort of the natural next step was to begin to address a lot of the inequities uh, around the education. You know, uh, trying to expand and broaden the families. Uh, uh, outlook of of the types of jobs you know from 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 just limited to agriculture to you know other uh you know types of careers that were out there uh so the organization started working around a lot around the, the educational system uh i didn't start until uh 2000 uh oh by the way I, I should mention that i'm very proud that my father was the founder of the organization and i started here in around 2000 so since I entered the organization, um, not only carrying the mission, but we immediately became very cohesive with the environmental justice movement and, uh, and have been part of the environmental justice movement since then. Uh, we have, um, uh, I mean, it's just so much to share, but we have right now actually currently, uh, um, you know, projects around research, around health, uh, the environmental justice policy work. So we have a pretty large spectrum of work. Uh, and um, I think one thing that really distinguishes us is our ability to, to be sustainable uh, in a way that uh, in, in a community that has been very distant and disconnected, like from Sacramento and DC, uh, where there's been a lot of local control, uh, you know, to where we've been able to sort of overcome a lot of the challenges uh, of not just being sort of a service type of organization, a quasi-governmental, but being really a true uh, advocacy, uh, uh, you know, mobilizing, organizing type of organization. Thank you, Luis. Um, there's a lot to dig into there. Um, obviously, the, the kind of the origins coming out of uh, your father and the farm worker movement. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen because I wanted to uh, take us back to this notion of, um, you mentioned the environmental justice piece and we also touched on the idea of toxic tours. And I know that's how you and I first met up and how we started talking about the issues in, in your community and then also getting to this notion of, you know, the revitalization, which is the theme of this this event. So let me uh, see if I can point everyone's attention to the screen. So um, this is quite the flowchart. <laughs> so I think 
um, we had a couple of points um, that we wanted to hit and we have a couple other uh, pieces uh, and other slides and we have a short clip that we can also share. But what I really wanted to uh, do is to have uh, to be able to tell the story of how everything that uh, we have worked on kind of began with a toxic tour. And you saw the poll, not a lot of folks have been on one and a lot of folks would like to go. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about that, what that is and, and how, how it all kind of came to be? Yeah, you mean uh, talk about the, the history of this, this flow chart here? Correct. Okay, so in, uh, it, I guess I have to go back to 19, uh, no, 2006 when I first met you, Ryan. Uh, met you in Wilmington, California, uh, where we're doing a, a, a toxic tour, environmental justice tour uh, out there with Jesse Marquez, uh, you know, learning about the water issues uh, uh, and, uh, and, you know, many other issues out there. So, you know, at that time, I think I met uh, Gail Filcher. He used to be a former pro environmental and the only environmental prosecutor that has ever uh, uh, worked in the Imperial County. Uh, and, and I think it was just a few months later that you contacted me and says, hey, Luis, you know, I, you know, I heard that you want to do one of these uh, EJ tours. You know, we, I think you and I ended up, you know, landing at the toxic tours. Um, <laughs> And, yeah. uh, you know, everything we're looking at is like, okay, well, let's look at these toxics. And uh, there were several things that came out of that, uh, I think, in an ongoing, ongoing discussions. And, and, and I don't know this is the norm, but I, you know, it was very unusual, you know, talking to a government person like yourself uh, and just having these long conversations, enormous amount of emails. You know, it didn't matter if it was midnight or early mornings. It's like we were just excited about this whole thing. And. Um, we started coming up with little, you know, uh, uh, ways to be able to get the most out of these toxic tours. And I remember we talked about, you know, well, instead of like kind of just showing all these array of issues in our community, let's, let's try to find those that we can see some immediate action, right? And so I think we, we arrived at, a, at approaching it as like, let's look, let's look at the top five issues that community is concerned with, you know? So... It was pretty effective because prior to that, you know, there was a lot of government meetings where the government come out, we talk about it, we just sort of unload on everything. And then government would just walk away. There was no commitments. There was just like, good luck, you know. It was, uh, it was a lot. I, I, I'm sorry. It was a lot. I'll, I remember as you were talking, I'm going to jump around to some pictures. So please sure. continue on, on, this, on this piece. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, just kind of following the flow. Uh, I think what's what's significant about this is not it's not all we have done, but a lot of this uh, was done in direct partnership with you, Ryan. Right? I mean, you were the contact, and then this whole tree of opportunity opened up, and it was just sort of having that that mindset of of innovating. You know, that mindset of what can we do different, and you know, we've already done these government visits too long. And, uh, and I think it's, you know, the more we knew about your job, Ryan, uh, and the more you knew about our experience, then we were able to then not make the same mistakes, right? For example, I think one of the things that came out immediately was, well, we don't hear this stuff in our government only task forces. So immediately, you know, that was an opportunity. It was like, well, let's change that, right? Let's, let's not make it a, a community government task force. So government actually has the ability to collect intelligence. And this was actually happening, by the way, at a time where there was an economic crisis. I think it might have been the housing, you know, the, 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 the whole the, subprime and the great, you know, the great the recession. The economy the great, was collapsing. Yes, the great and, recession. And government yes. was like, oh, we can't travel no more. Kind of like right now, like with COVID, right? It's the same thing. You know, we've lived it like three times already. Oh, we can't travel, you know. Uh, and so this was one way that we were able to to stay in contact with community, you know, whether it was through uh, the local staff or uh, over the, you know, these conference phone line systems. Uh, but one thing that you actually came up with that a lot of people might not be familiar with is that as you were going to university, you were doing plotting of, of uh, uh, contaminated sites on Google Earth. And we're like, hey, wait a minute, why don't we try that for the next bus tour? You know, instead of just, going to five sites, let's plot them on a public space, 
you know, people can visualize it. And then that immediately led into uh, you again, finding this crowdsourcing database called Ushahidi that some might be familiar with it because it, it really became popular when the Louisiana oil spill and the bucket brigade were utilizing it. So, you know, at that time, it wasn't something that you can download. You know, you actually needed a programmer. So we had a, a buddy of mine, you know, it's like, hey, can you help me? It's like, yeah. <laughs> so he went in, downloaded and and we used that for a little while. And the more effective that became, because now it wasn't just a verbal, right? And, right. and the señoras, you know, the, the, the grandmothers and the mothers and, and, and the neighbors uh, in our neighborhoods, you know, many who are monolingual Spanish speaking were like, oh, you know, so-and-so politician came out. He promised he'd clean the new river. He promised he'd do this about this toxic site. But once we started plotting it, something different happened. You know, it was no longer just verbal. It was documented somewhere that, you know, that lived in the internet, that lived in the public um, domain, in the public's view. So that immediately, we noticed that it wasn't just the traditional, like, you know, good luck with your issue. It was like, oh, shoot, now we got to do something about this, right? And yeah, all these images are just, you know, kind of part of, of the, uh, the whole history, you know, of, and, and there's, you know, tons and tons of more, right? But what, again, what's significant is, is it all started with you, Ryan. Uh, and then we've been able to expand now the Ivan Task Forces, and all these task forces in Comité, it's our partners uh, in all these communities in Coachella and in, in, in the central, in, in San Joaquin Valley and in, in uh, Kings County and in, in uh, the Bay Area. Uh, Actually, in there's Los Angeles. In these so breakout all rooms. Listed there. What was that? In these breakout rooms for this event, I mean, I, there's several partners. Um, so I, I encourage folks, and they're all going to be recorded. You probably know. So uh, you can go back and reference um, what Luis is, 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 is alluding to here and talking about is the partnerships and the network that grew out of, out of uh, this work across the state. There's others uh, that are in the breakout rooms, uh, as Luis mentioned, at the, and the other ones. So uh, sorry to interrupt, Luis. Please continue as, as we talk about kind of what came out of that touring and then uh, the task forces. And then as we get deeper into this kind of this conceptual model uh, or flow chart, it, you start seeing like things like um, legislation and initiatives in, 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 in complaint database systems being updated. And can you talk about that part, this, this middle uh, column here? I, I, absolutely, you know. Uh, so yeah, everything you see here is is all stemmed from these conversations, these partnerships, your know, success after success, uh, and then you know we got into the uh, AB ten seventy one, which was supplemental environmental projects. Uh, so what what we discovered as we were finding more of these environmental issues, they were getting responded to, and at that time, Department of Toxics through the Coupa uh, was uh, one of our, our main partners at the time. And, uh, and certainly, you know, some of these complaints from the community were turning into violations. And then we would ask, well, where's the money going? Well, it wasn't going back to the neighborhoods and the communities where these violations were occurring. Uh, and so that opened the door for an opportunity to partner with assembly member Eduardo Garcia. Uh, and, and another EJ group also uh, uh, had a, a similar idea uh, with a speaker at the time, I think assembly speaker, Tony Atkins. So there was, you know, this partnership to push this AB 1071 to make sure that at least 50% of those violation dollars went back to environmental justice communities. And it hasn't been easy. It wasn't like an immediate, like, oh yeah, here we're, we're surrendering these dollars. It took a little bit of a, of a struggle with the agencies to get them off these, you know, old legacy projects and get them invested into, you know, the, the you know, projects that, you know, instead of double victimizing environmental justice by taking the money from, from uh, the, the environmental justice issues that had occurred uh, is getting these money back. And a lot of great projects are funded right now and continue to be funded. Multimedia enforcement initiatives, again, it all born from the same because when we go out on these toxic tours, you know, you might see a puddle of contaminated water, but then, then you, you know, we start talking about, I go, wait a minute, it's contaminated because of deposition, you know, air transport, pesticides drift, you know, and all of a sudden it was like, hey, we need more agencies here because government is so compartmentalized. It's not like you can just dial 911 and you're gonna get the emergency call and it's a one-stop shop, it's not. 
So, you know, again, that's why you, Ryan, became so critical to this. You became the first problem solver, government sponsored, government agent that would help decipher, you know, the web of environmental protection that, you know, it's synonymous to a Rolodex, you know, I mean, in some ways, government <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Move. Let's just let's just clarify for the folks that are on this uh, meeting that don't know what a Rolodex is. It was like like our contacts that we used to have to go through. You know, the, the, the Rolodex, I remember you called it the Rolodex, the environmental Rolodex or the regulatory Rolodex problem. Like, who do you call? You know, if there's a specific issue, you mentioned this thing uh, called the COOPA, which is where I worked at another agency. It's an acronym in here in California for Certified Unified Program Agency. They serve as the uh, like the local environmental regulatory uh, uh, um, agency there in different jurisdictions, you know, counties and, and things like this. And so I was I was an inspector. And so we did um, enforcement, environmental enforcement. And so that's how a lot of this uh, was able to get addressed. But uh, Luis is what Luis is really getting at, if I can, Luis, is the fact that this work informed like the this work informed and if I this was my uh, um, well we'll get to this here in a sec I, I think we still have time for this part but the toxic tours and the local regulatory enforcement at the ground level which I was a part of and our team our group was a part of at um, DTSC the Coupa there in Imperial County we were able to um, do the the regulatory the basic regulatory enforcement at the local level and that kind of got the ball rolling with these little victories and then these penalties and then these environmental projects that came from the penalties and the SEPs, they call them supplemental environmental projects that fed back into uh, uh, as a, a resource for this system. So sorry to interrupt, Luis. Did you want to get to, um, as we as we move, moving to the right, I mean, there's so much going on here from the SEPs. I mean, you see things like tangible things like school air filtration, right? You see tangible things like uh, air grants uh, and you see tangible things like the people's blueprint, AB 617. Can you, can you talk about the line from this model to AB 617? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think that, uh, again, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's real hard to track, but, you know, it was a real good exercise, you know, working with you, Ryan, and you know, kind of coming up with some key milestones. Obviously, if we were to capture everything, it'd be multiple times larger than this. But, you know, I just thought like some relevant things that are happening right now where people might not see like kind of like where it began and, and you know, how, you know, our role in, in, uh, in having, you know, these, the, what, what has turned into opportunities for funding, opportunities for research. Um, but, you know, in order to explain sort of the air grants and the People's Blueprint, uh, which the People's Blueprint is sort of a new uh, effort to, to make, to bring it to where it should have been, you know, the first uh, uh, pass of the Blueprint, uh, it's part of 8617, but it all started back with uh, conversations with you, Ryan, where you're like, hey, did, have you, you know, now that we're dealing with these uh, complaint systems, um, the community's complaint system, which is the IVAN, uh, you know, there's this crowdsourcing bill by U.S. Senator Coons. A few years later, then, you know, we come up with, um, uh, you know, your ideas, we put them to work uh, and, and we developed this, uh, uh, you know, draft language and we're able to partner with Assemblymember Garcia for AB 1187 uh, that we intended to institutionalize crowdsourcing and citizen science. Because one of the things we learned is government won't do it if it's not in their job description. Government won't do it if it's not an institutionalized uh, obligation. So we learn these terms right away. So we learn how to get government to do things. Uh, you know, obviously that bill, you know, didn't get, you know, uh, you know, basically sort of quietly died and then 617 surfaced, you know, which was great because it actually put money, to, you know, in, in, uh, and did more, right? Did more than what we were trying to do but certainly served as a foundation to building 617. Uh, and again, you know, a lot of these other things that, that uh, have been done is again, the community air grants. I know that we had enormous amount of conversations, not only with ourselves, Ryan, but you know, you were uh, uh, consulting, you know, environmental justice up and down the state with our IBM partners and others. 
Um, again, the, the People's Blueprint is just our latest effort to make sure that 617 is delivering on that promise that was put at the table back when in 2017. Uh, air notification program, uh, again, this whole history has allowed us to develop a, a network of air monitors that, uh, the, that were funded by the National Institutes of Health in partnership with Tracking California, uh, University of, of, of Berkeley, and then Washington, then UCLA, uh, certainly with the support of the California Air Resources Board. Uh, and, and, and again, you know, that helped inform the 1187 and 617, right? Because now that's what we're, that's, that's the whole sort of uh, innovation, right? And I think you used another term uh, yesterday, Ryan, as we were talking about this, um, uh, you know, that falls within the theme of this conference. And, and the last, you know, piece I'll put in here is, is how significant, you know, again, having these conversations and taking these lessons learned and getting them in the right hands, you know, in this case with Secretary Crawford and, and Secretary Blumenfeld and, and how they've been able to then uh, recognize and within their, um, um, their role, be able to create environmental justice, key environmental justice positions that are part of the core mission. Mm. Because before it was only like the EJ only went as far as assistant secretary. Now we have deputies. Now we have people in key positions. Now we're having job descriptions that are obligating to respond to, you know, whether you're on air, water, uh, you know, public lands, that type of thing. Doesn't matter what media you cover or, or what your program is, they're starting to put in your their job description, public health you know, the uh, uh, disadvantaged communities, environmental justice. So it can no longer be an option to, to integrate, you know, this work uh, into their, their uh, job descriptions. Now it's becoming an obligation. So they can't bail out no more, right? It's not in my job description. But look, you know, there's a lot of people like you, Ryan, who didn't wait for it to be your job description. You just did it because that's uh, what your, your moral and, 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 and what you felt your duty was, right? So... Yeah, thanks, Luis. Um, so what folks are looking at here is um, Luis always had this notion of, um, uh, I don't know if you're big like on software or something, but like like number this numbering system, like EJ 5.0. So you always had this like this, 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 this con con concept. And so we talked about it and it's always like we're never, you know, going to get there, but it's a, it would be a good place to go and to try to get there. And so just, I'm just was trying to conceptualize um, and put some pictures in the previous chart um, and just kind of how from the humble beginnings of things like uh, doing these response methodologies like a bus tour, right? Because you came to us, you came to my boss actually and said, what's going on, we need to address these issues. And so we did that with these response methodologies like, like the bus tours. Um, and that was, you know, having that immediate engagement and response was kind of like kicking it to the next, to the next level 2.0 and kind of on this simplified spectrum that I put together. And then we, we had the transparency piece that you mentioned, these, you know, very rudimentary, I remember the, you know, just using Google Earth, right, and, and 20, or when was it, 2000, you saw, I think we had the, the, the chart there, like 2007, 2008, putting these things together, putting pins on the board, you know, we'd have everybody in the room, and then we'd have some, you know, a way to transparently see we're all on the same page, and then um, at some point when we, there was um, these SEPs, these Supplemental Environmental Project uh, and these programs that were made available to the community. That's when you begin to see um, some of this data collection uh, at the uh, at a more granular level, at a different resolution. In this, in this case, air. I mean, but again, this is multimedia. There was soils work. There was water work. This was, you know, regarding air specifically, but you know, at that resolution, um, you know, you know, you start to see things like hotspots and, and things like like this. Um, and that was, you know, could inform targeted enforcement, perhaps, and just took it to a different place. So all of these things are building, you know, it's informative. The previous uh, is prologue and it informs the present, right, and going forward, and we're moving along the spectrum to 617. And, 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 and 4.0, in terms of the community engaged participatory framework. 
right? Because like, I think you were, we talked about drawing the line from Ivan, the Ivan model to AB 617, the community steering committees, where did that, where did that language come from? Where did that terminology come came from? It came from the, the groups and the projects and the workshops that you were doing in the early aughts, 2004, 2005, 2006, having these informed uh, community spaces. Um, and then 5.0, you know, EJ 5.0, uh, zero emission, the future, where we wanna be. So it's interesting how from the humble beginnings of these kind of initial response methodologies, all the way through the future, uh, the executive order, the dream of uh, zero emissions, right? In terms of air, we're talking about air now. So um, it, it's a lot to take in, uh, but you know what, Luis, we do wanna save some time. We have about 10 minutes. We'd like to open it up for Q and A. Um, how does that sound? Oh, absolutely, yes. Thank you, Ren. Okay, so I stopped sharing my screen um, and um, Mackenzie, uh, our partner behind the scenes, um, I'm wondering if there are any immediate questions or do we wanna kind of open it up for uh, a Q&A uh, for folks? Looks like we have one question in the chat right now from Brianna, if you wanna address that. Ah, I see, thank you. Uh, can you please talk more about the use of citizen science. Um, sure, I, I can say a few words, Luis, um, and then I'd like to hear your thoughts. But so, yeah, I think citizen science is by now, you know, 2021, everybody knows uh, the deal back in 20 or 2005, 2006. This was kind of like groundbreaking stuff. It was different. Luis uses this terminology. Um, the democratization of data. So um, you couldn't get a lot of things online in 2005 that you can get in 2021. Um, and so particularly um, when you, like in terms of environmental enforcement, um, there was a lot of things that were hard to get online. You'd have to go in and do a, you know, records request and make copies and pay five cents a page, things like that. But now I read there's more data, you know, data available online. And pretty soon people saw the value in that. And I know the groups that we worked with in Imperial saw the value in that. And they took it a step further when these um, tools and these low cost sensors started to come out. I'm talking about air, air, um, air sensors and other types of, uh, in the, you know, uh, field uh, tools, XRF, things like the XRF is very expensive, but there's handheld equipment that you could take into the field. So things like this, but um, those things are not just, you know, regulatory agencies can't buy them. Everyone, anyone can buy them. And so then you start to see um, this, 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 this kind of coming, uh, uh, the rising up of folks that are collecting their own data. You see, Obviously, research institutions have always been, you know, doing this. Uh, they're the leading edge. Uh, and so uh, a lot of this, um, we started um, to take into account the citizen science piece, and we started to integrate that into the, the model that Luis is talking about here, the Ivan model. And it wasn't just air at the beginning. It was actually multimedia. It was soils. It was, you know, the, the water... Um, I mean, you can buy like a water testing kit for metals, you know, rudimentary uh, analysis, like at Home Depot, things like this. I mean, water issues in Imperial were, were huge. I mean, Luis, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's how we got started, right? Some of those things too. And so um, citizen science, that piece really started to come on board, like around, for me, if I remember, 2008, 9, and 10. And that really started getting integrated into the, the model. I don't know, Luis, if you wanted to chime in. Yeah, you know, a couple of things. One is uh, I do want to acknowledge that even though we've gone through this journey, um, certainly um, a journey that, that you know, should be replicated. Every community has sort of its own uh, uh, unique characteristics and, and politics and so much goes on that this is, it's not just sort of a cookie cutter approach. 
Uh, and, and the same goes, you know, with technology. You know, it's not like, you know, when we created the Ivan, it was like, oh, now we got Ivan and now let's just duplicate it everywhere. It wasn't like that. You know, one of the first things we did, we respected each community and, and the communities, EJ communities and partners that wanted us to replicate this crowdsourcing citizen science models that have now been expanding across the state. Uh, it was, it, you know, it, it was it was being uh, driven and 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 asked for by communities and being tailored to make sure that it met the community's needs. And, and you're right, Ryan, uh, a lot of the work in citizen science isn't just limited to like say air monitoring, but it's also when we would go out uh, and in your regulatory capacity and, and, and get split samples, you know, mm. learn how to do wipe samples, learn how to collect dust out of the uh, storm drains or, you know, sidewalks or surfaces on, you know, or wherever the drain, <laughs> the, the, the rainwater drained, you know, and so on. You know, all of that was citizen science because we had no knowledge. You know, those building blocks, you know, led to the point when then we, you know, um, started working on, you know, the crowdsourcing and then sort of opened a whole new door about technology, right, that we didn't have, but we built that capacity over time. And then, and then the opportunity to do air monitoring, that um, the, the community monitoring came about, uh, not about our current situation, because I always like to acknowledge that we have a, a more positive relationship with our air district. Uh, there was a point in time where they were just a vault. Like you couldn't get nothing out of them, no partnership, no data, nothing. And they had monitors that constantly failed. And they had one of their federal reference monitors that was off for like three or four years. You know, so that was the motivation that we didn't trust the data and that we needed to find a cost effective, affordable alternative. Fortunately, the National Institutes of Health put out an R, uh, um, one of their RFPs uh, for research to action. Fortunately, we had a really good relationship with Tracking California, uh, which we still do today. So, you know, it's, it's, it, it, I think it's, uh, it's important to kind of acknowledge, you know, the array of, of access that, that uh, in partnerships uh, in order for, to make a lot of this work, you know. Um, the community monitoring and the, uh, the, our ability to be able to bring high scientific integrity into it is very important because as is, a lot of times citizen science isn't respected. And that's why in the beginning I said, we had to get it institutionalized because that's why we kept hearing. We're not gonna listen to you until you institutionalize. Well, it, it became, you know, um, yeah, uh, so notable that that's why then, okay, well, let's utilize the bill, you know, and then that's how we institutionalized it. But, uh, you know, for us, citizen science and community monitoring is complementary to the regulatory monitoring that goes on out there. And it's a way to, to, to gain education. It's a way for even schools have been able to meet their STEM uh, requirements. Uh, environmental literacy has now is, is, is now is a sort of requirement in California. Uh, civic leadership, you know. So uh, I think that citizen science is is a way for community readiness to be able to get them to, yeah, certainly where we're at. Uh, but in some ways, you know, we still have a long road ahead, and it's important to to leave a a um, a, a a path. Right? What is it like a, a roadmap for other communities? Because just because we might be talking a lot, a lot of things that we might have been able to to make progress on, doesn't mean that other communities are there. So we need to be able to create a roadmap for them to also uh, shorten the distance in, in, into catching up into this journey. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Hey, solamente una un breve comentario para ellos que ocupan asistencia en español. Aquí estamos para servirles. Si hay preguntas, comentarios, por favor, levanten sus manos. If you have a question or you want to have a, a quick comment, we have a few minutes left. Please use the raise hand uh, feature in the Zoom. I do see we have a comment from Stacy Lovatos. Uh, Luis, how can I get on your Rolodex? <laughs> Love it. Um, <laughs> I would uh, like to reach, uh, she started with uh, EPA's Office of Environmental Justice last March and would like resources to reach, her resources to reach people directly. Um, and she, that she says that you were right about not being a 911 number to call. So that's, that's a great comment, Stacy. 
Um, so I, I imagine, I think Stacy uh, Luis uh, will be in contact uh, with you. We have. Um, I put my email there just, uh, you know, to be reached and I can share my number thereafter. But uh, Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, Thank I you, welcome Luis. anybody who wants to reach and you know, have a conversation. And, and I welcome all conversations, you know, I, I always, you know, because we are advocates. I also welcome conversations where people disagree. I, I can always learn. You know? Right. You know, we're not perfect, but I welcome all conversations. Thank you, Stacy. I'll be in contact. Right. And then and, I, and, and, and Ryan, I do want to recognize that I see Jill um, Harrison here. Yes. Uh, I know she's the, the author of the Inside Out uh, uh, book. Uh, and I remember the exact title. Sorry, Jill. But I, I you know, your, your book certainly captures a good snapshot of of, you know, just how valuable it is to have these government, part, trusted government partnerships, right? So. And Jill wanted to know more about the blueprint and how it, the people's blueprint, how it differs from CARBs. We have one minute for folks to jump back into the main room. I don't know how far we can dig into this. Um, you, you have like a few words you want to say on that, Luis, really quick before we jump into the main room. Well, as the name says it, so far it's the people's blueprint. Now, uh, in in the course of its development, uh, right now it's been shared with the larger, more diverse group that includes other stakeholders, including our districts. So, so far it's the people's blueprint, but it might become something else. So let's hope it stays as the people's blueprint. You know, it's just mm -hmm. completely informed by environmental justice at this point. And, and, and I think that's the spirit of, that gave it its name, the People's Blueprint. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, audience members, all those with commentaries and uh, for folks listening in, we appreciate you. Thank you. Um, and um, we can close out now. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Mackenzie. We'll leave it to you to, to close us out. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Mackenzie. Thank you all.